Are you kidding me? Another video about worms? That's right. Language. I realize we've been due for another freak ass worm video for a while because there's a lot of freak ass worms. If you're not familiar with worms, you probably think of them as just worms. Worms are just worms, nothing special. But boy, are you not correct. There are so many worms and so many freak ass worms. Worms are everywhere. They're some of the smallest and largest animals on the planet. They live in every habitat imaginable, from deep sea hydrothermal vents to the insides of animals as parasites, including us. And worms have evolved separately multiple times, meaning not all worms are the same kind of worm at all. So with that many worms, there are bound to be some that are complete and total freaks. And that is what brings us here today. So buckle up, maybe put your lunch aside for a second while I introduce you to another batch of some freak ass worms. We're gonna start off with a heavy hitter, the acorn worm, named such for its acorn shaped proboscis. We all know what the fuck it looks like. Love They're found all throughout the ocean, up to 10,000 feet below the surface of the ocean. And they generally range from like three to 17 inches long, generally. The min and max are much more extreme, a mere millimeter to over six feet long. Do you think maybe he's compensating for something? Six feet of this. Heinous. Acorn worms belong to the phylum Hemichordata, which just so happens to be very closely related to our own phylum. Chordata. If you're not familiar with a phylum, it's a very, very large group of animals that have a common ancestor that was alive a very, very long time ago. Our phylum is Chordata. It includes every animal with a backbone and then some. So all mammals, reptiles, birds, fish, amphibians, all bony things, some random shit like sea squirts. Another phylum is Arthropoda. It includes all arthropods, insects, arachnids, also crabs and shrimp, the crustaceans. That's a lot of animals. There are many other animal phyla, Cephalopoda, Mollusca, Etc. There's a shit ton of animals, and so there are also a shit ton of phyla, including Hemichordata, which includes the acorn worms and also shit like this. And they are somehow more closely related to us than all of the other phyla I mentioned. So you might be thinking, how? Well, aside from the obvious genetic evidence, there's a key similarity that our two groups have in common, and it has to do with the earliest stages of development. Boom, a cell. That is the product of a sperm fertilizing an egg. This teeny cell will soon become a baby, but before that, what does it need? Yes, more cells. So it starts to replicate and form a hollow ball of cells. Let's take a cross section, a little slice. You know what else it needs? Yes, holes, specifically a mouth and an anus. In most animals, the mouth develops first. These animals are called protostomes, which translates to mouth first. But in some animals, the anus develops first. These are the deuterostomes, which translates to mouth second. We, chordates, and hemichordates are deuterostomes, the development of the anus first. It's what bonds the two groups together. There's a third group of deuterostomes, by the way, the echinoderms, which are the sea stars, sea urchins, sand dollars, etc. I've talked about them before as deuterostomes, but they're irrelevant for this moment in time. Just figured I'd mention that just in case that was confusing. But you know what that means? We are more closely related to a worm that looks like this than to the intelligent octopus. And this ancient relationship traces its origins back hundreds of millions of years to the development of a whole. So back to the modern day acorn worms, which by the way, I wanna mention, I was researching this section of the video at a cafe in public and I felt like a freak. I actually stopped researching while I was at the cafe because I felt like I was gonna get kicked out if anyone saw what I was looking at. Probably thought I was looking at medical pictures of a disfigured, fucked up acorn. Like, this diagram specifically, showing the anatomy of whatever the fuck they got going on. As you can see, there is a proboscis, a collar, and a trunk. That's what the fuck they got going on. It's a very simple, freak-looking worm, a certified freak-ass worm. One of the more well-known acorn worms is Yoda purpurata, very cool name, but it looks like a medical emergency. They're found about 5,000 feet below the surface of the Atlantic Ocean, and they're somewhere between four and a half to seven and a half inches long. They're named Yoda, due to their very large lateral lips, reminiscent of the ears of Yoda. Yes. In some of the images of Yoda crawling along the ocean floor, there's some sort of trail behind them. That's shit. That's what they're all about. Acorn worms feed on sediment in search of organic particles to sort through and digest for nutrients, and then shit the rest out. Very simple creatures. Gonna be honest, I'm ready to move on from them and check out the next worm on the list. Allow me to introduce you to the scale worms in a family called Polynoidae. They're like the armored tanks of the worm world. Short, flat, covered in overlapping plate-like scales called elytra. There's about 900 species, ranging from just a few millimeters to 
about the size of your hand. That's a big worm. And they're found everywhere from tide pools to the deepest trenches in hydrothermal vents. They really fuck with hydrothermal vents. Scale worms are a group of bristle worms. You might remember from the other worm videos I've made on this channel. Like other bristle worms, scale worms are segmented. They've got somewhere between 15 to 100 segments on their bodies. And on top of those segments, the scales, which can be shed and regrown. And in some species, bioluminescent. A scale worm can roll up when threatened, like a pangolin, which is very cute and makes you want to protect them because they are so small and rolled up. No need to fret, they can protect themselves and not only with their scales. Many scale worms have symbiotic relationships with other animals, like Arctino. They like to live on animals like sea stars and just hang out, don't really do much. They get protection and maybe eat bacteria off their backs and occasionally create worm paths as evidence of their visit. Another one, Branchipollina. These are some of the ones that really fuck with hydrothermal vents. They live inside giant vent muscles. For a long time, they were thought to just hang out, not impact the muscle's quality of life. But turns out this might be parasitic. Turns out the muscles get tissue damage and stunted growth on occasion. Freak gas, parasitic worm. Most of these scale worms are predators, but some feed on bacterial mats. To reproduce, they free spawn throwing their shit out into the water and hoping that it sticks. Their heads are packed with sensory gear, antenna, palps, sometimes a couple eyes. But enough about the general shit. I'm building up to one scale worm in particular I wanted to show you. Feast your eyes on the Atlantic scale worm, a beast found in the waters of, you guessed it, Antarctica. Like their brethren, they're covered in scales, but their most heinous body part is their retractable mouth. Yes, retractable, tucked and untucked, equipped with large, sharp teeth meant for quick and aggressive hunts. This freak gets to eight inches long. And you'll notice when shriveled up and taken outside of their deep sea dwelling, it looks like their segmented bodies are made up of human teeth. What a heinous coincidence. Let me show you what they look like in real life. You might like them a little more. Still images of them are very harsh. They're not very photogenic. They look a lot better on video. Hey, actually pretty cool. Move, very cool. Wow, look at those scales. All right, the next one on the list is this. I know what you're thinking. Doesn't look like much of a worm at all. Looks like a lot of things. Definitely not a worm, but yet it is. This is Ketopterus pugaporcinus, also known as the pig butt worm. And that's actually what their species name translates to. Despite their appearance, this is yet another bristle worm. Yeah, just like the scale worms and the other bristle worms from other videos, which means yes, they're also segmented. You just can't tell because the middle segment's got a BBL. They sequence their DNA because this is not an obvious bristle worm at first glance. And determined they fit into the family Ketopteridae, whose relatives look nothing like them. This is a super twisted, freak ass worm. The pig butt worm is about the size of a hazelnut and drifts through the water column at like three to 4,000 feet below the surface of the ocean. They remain buoyant here with the help of their inflated cheeks. And this is also, of course, where they eat. The way they eat is as freak ass as the animal itself. Pig butt worm creates mucus. It casts out a web of sticky snot into the water around it. A sticky mucus net, kind of like a spider web. It traps tiny bits of organic debris called marine snow. Also, by the way, they're bioluminescent and their mucus net glows with them for a few seconds when threatened. I feel like I've mentioned marine snow a few times on this channel, but never really went in depth on what it actually is. So let's get into it. Marine snow sounds very graceful. And I guess in some ways it is. What it's made up of is not. As we all know, most of life in the oceans is near the surface where sunlight can hit. Things are growing, things are popping. Life is flourishing here. Nutrients are nutrienting. Actually, if you've ever seen the movie, The Platform or read the book, this is a good analogy for this. If you haven't seen it, it's this prison with hundreds of floors and the food for the prison moves through this hole from the top to the very bottom. So at the very top, like floor one, they get a whole banquet. Shit is great for them. They don't finish it. So whatever they don't finish goes to the next floor. They get to eat. Next floor, they eat their leftovers and it keeps going and so on. And floor 200, it is the actual trenches. They are perpetually starving. That's how nutrients in the ocean work, kind of. Life at the top, got plenty to choose from. Let's say a shark eats a seal. A couple of chunks fly off in the mix of it. Those chunks start to sink, start to get eaten up by some smaller fish down below. Smaller chunks fly off in the mix of it. And what's left is this conveyor belt of smaller and smaller chunks making their way down to the depths. And the chunks can be anything, not just seal, obviously. Any dead or decaying plants and animals, particles of shit, plankton, bacteria, literally anything that is not seawater. It's all in this conveyor belt called marine snow. Despite being a heinous selection of bites to choose from, it is really the only reason life can survive in the deep sea in the first place. It acts as the very base of the food chain, unless you're near hydrothermal vents or other deep sea oases like a whale fall. 
And speaking of whale falls, they are exactly where you'd find the next worm on the list, the bone-eating snot flower, also known as Osidax worms. They eat the bones of, you guessed it, whales that sink to the bottom of the ocean floor and create a temporary habitat for the level 200 residents. Osidax worms thrive in these habitats, using their root-like structures to infiltrate the bones. Because here's the thing about Osidax worms. They have no mouth, no gut, no anus. So these roots aren't just for anchoring. They're packed with symbiotic bacteria that they use to extract nutrients. Bacteria break down the organic compounds trapped within the whale bones and provide the worms with nutrients they need to survive. And what's sick is traces of these worms have been found on fossilized whale bones from up to 30 million years ago. These bitches have been around and have also probably been fucking up our fossil record of bones because they're eating them. But can't be mad. Obviously the whale bones are much more important to them than they are to us. The last worm I was gonna talk about on the list is actually disgusting. I've actually kind of decided I'm not really gonna get into it. If you have a problem with worms past the kind of worms I've showed you so far, I suggest you leave now. I'm gonna do a little Spark Notes version because it's on the list. I might as well tell you, but it's really just horrific to do a whole section about. I don't know what I was thinking adding it to the video, but I was looking for worms to put in this video. And I found this article last month. A 35 year old man in India couldn't pee. It's okay. No, 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 no. Turns out it's because there was a foot long worm living in his kidney. No! The worm's scientific name is Dioctophyma renali. It's apparently a very rare parasite that he probably got from eating raw fish. The article also said the patient also noted that this was not the first time he had passed such a worm. I added it to the list for the video, but I decided I actually did not want my knowledge of this worm to go any further than the live science article. Turns out there are some worms that are even too freak ass for me. Also, I hate the recommended articles they gave me. You may like. No, I will not like. That's how we're ending this video. If you liked it, for some reason, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next. Ah, you know, I've got some other worm videos that you can check out and I won't be doing one for a little bit. The next video I'm putting out is arguably a lot more enjoyable. The History of Cats, episode three. Keep up with behind the scenes content and our Discord server on Patreon. And for now, stay curious. The world has a lot for us to learn. See ya.